As quoted in the introduction to this powerful new report, we must adapt, question, and look with a naive eye on the possibility of why something is or isn't. Now, given the pressures that you may fa be facing in maximizing the performance of your team on a daily basis, I'd be willing to guess that those joining here today maybe haven't spent as much time questioning the why behind Derry and its bloated role among our athlete community. But fear not, today we have you covered. Not only have we spent that time, I'm gonna cut right to the chase here. The, tr the truth really is that removing dairy from your fitness and diet regimen absolutely will help you achieve that objective of maximized performance. I'm a recovering division one collegiate athlete myself. And if there's an industry who deserves more scrutiny than the dairy industry, I'm really not sure what it might be. Now, I happen to be moderating today's call from Minneapolis, an epicenter of dairy farming and marketing and distribution, you name it, and not so proudly neighbors to, uh, you know, that state dairy land next door, Wisconsin. And while this dairy legacy is proudly marketed on everything here from license plates to barter carvings at the state fair, they always seem to leave out the fact that dairy is the single most subsidized food on the in the country, that it makes most of us sick and that it's been slowing athletes down for generations. Now from the day that Switch for Good Mission started about three years ago, two words have been consistently used to navigate its course, truth and justice. And with the release of the Dairy Does a Body Bad report, Switch for Good has once again delivered a powerful dose of exactly that. For those of you who didn't spend your last days of summer pouring through this nearly 50 page report, let me break it down for you. Its intent is to look with that naive eye towards claims made by the milk industry regarding the health and athletic performance of its products. Now it's really a tour de force. The, the report covers everything from the dairy industry's negative effect on athlete performance to its history of exploiting and targeting athletes and its marketing from the cozy relationship between the US government and the industry itself, and how dairy has disproportionately sickened athletes and people of color. The report took nearly a year to compile. It includes more than 300 specific citations to back up all of its very compelling claims, and features contributions from nearly a dozen highly regarded medical professionals, several of whom we are lucky enough to have with us today. In fact, if I could steal another quote from the report, if there's one thing an athlete needs most, it's the ability to take a good deep breath. So let's go ahead and take that big deep breath together as we have a lot to get to today. First up on our panel is the wise man I've just quoted, Dr. James Loomis. Dr. Loomis is an internal medicine physician and the current medical director at Bernard Medical Center in Washington, DC. He has served as team internist for the St. Louis Rams and the St. Louis Cardinals, winning, by the way, both a Super Bowl ring and a World Series ring for those teams. He is also the tour physician for the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra, which may not have a championship ring just yet, but in my book is equally as cool. Next up is Dr. Angie Sadecki. Dr. Sadecki is a gastroenterologist, goodness, I always mess that up, gastroenterologist, which she is board certified in as well as an internal medicine, as well as an internal medicine. She is an author and expert on the impact of diet on the gut microbiota and health. Joining her right by her side today is James Marin. He's a registered dietitian and environmental nutritionist who specializes in diabetes, autoimmune diets, gastrointestinal treatments, and pediatric nutrition. And one other item of note, both Dr. Sadecki and Mr. Marin, um, they're also part of a, a great new founding team that has opened the Institute of Plant-Based Medicine. Medicine. Their mission is to treat, prevent, and reverse disease using a multi-specialty approach uh, that really combines plant-based nutrition with evidence-based medicine. And you can learn all uh, you, you want to about their amazing new practice at iopbm.com. Again, that is Institute of Plant-Based Medicine, iopbm.com. And finally, it is always my honor to introduce a dear friend, the founder and executive director of Switch for Good and the Ultimate Truth Warrior, Dotsie Bosch. A former professional cyclist, Dotsie is an Olympic medalist. 
multiple USA national champion and Pan American champion. And oh, by the way, she's also a former world record holder. Now you most certainly came today to learn from each one of our distinguished guests and not listen to me. So let me just get a few last housekeeping items out of the way here. Uh, each of our panelists will now offer their perspectives on the report. We will then be hosting a Q&A session. Really hope that uh, all of your qu great questions uh, come our way. You can enter them at any time using the little Q&A button right down there at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will do our very best to get to all of the questions today. If for some reason we run out of time, we will be publishing a complete FAQ uh, from this session uh, and distributing that to uh, all participants. So with that said, let's get started. And first up as our Chief Truth Warrior, Dotsie, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Chris. Welcome, everyone. Yes, it's true. This report has been a long time coming, and it's not without the magnificent efforts of multiple PhDs, MDs, and dietitians committed to the science and to the unbiased truth. So I'm so grateful you are all here, and I, I really believe that this discussion will be worth your while. As you know, we've got three incredible medical experts waiting to speak, so I'm going to leave the science to them. But what I really want to press upon you is the why behind this report. Nothing like this report has ever been published. The vast majority of the professional and amateur sports world still believe that dairy does a body good. And that is mostly in part due to the fact that the dairy industry tells us so. The athletes training under the US Olympic Committee are inundated with milk marketing, not science. And I was one of those athletes as I was leading into the 2012 Olympic Games. I felt isolated and, and unsupported in trying to figure out on my own how to recover as an elite athlete without cow's milk. And dairy's marketing machine trickles all the way down to high school athletes, as some public school athletic programs are even sponsored by chocolate milk. Pouring money into athletes and teams to tell Big Dairy's bias story is not science-based, it's big business-based, and we deserve better. There are no disclaimers on dairy's advertising warning people that consuming dairy will also cause inflammation and digestive issues, inhibit breathing and blood flow, and ultimately slow recovery. No warning that 70% of you are intolerant to even digesting the lactose in milk and will experience bloating, stomach cramping, itchy skin rashes, and possibly even severe constipation or diarrhea. Athletes need to know everything that comes along with a glass of cow's milk, and the detriments far outweigh any positives. And Chris, since you gave us your uh, kind of favorite line in the report, I think you gave two, I'm going to do the same. In the section of the report that questions whether chocolate milk is indeed the ultimate recovery beverage, it says, it must be stated that people do not consume human breast milk throughout life, nor is human breast milk considered to be a sports nutrition beverage? Our Dairy Does a Body Bad report is combating milk and dairy marketing with science. 322 citations to be exact. We've gone the flashy TV advertising route too, but with 100 years of promotion under its belt and a $90 million marketing budget last year alone, the dairy industry has a bit more wingspan than we do in that area. Many of you may be familiar with the national commercial that launched Switch for Good in 2018. It was supposed to air during the closing ceremonies of the Winter Olympic Games, but once the dairy industry heard of it, they convinced NBC to pull the commercial without notifying us first. We had paid for that commercial, but it was ripped out right under, from right under us without a word. Now that's the power we're up against, and we're going to keep fighting so that the whole story has enough oxygen to emerge and you can make up your own mind once you are presented with the impartial science. Now, after this exclusive sneak peek at the report to all of you wonderful people, we will get a recording of this Zoom call to everyone who could not attend, and we will continue educating the sports world so that athletes and teams have a real shot at understanding the mechanisms that help them recover best and therefore perform at their peak. And here's where you come in. If this education session motivates you, you can all help by sharing this report sending along to friends or family members, your coworkers, your workout buddies, other teams, and even your alma mater. So right now, before we even dive in any deeper, I'm gonna challenge you all to think of two people you can definitely send this report to. All right, you got them? Awesome. I'm gonna turn it back over to Chris. 
Uh, fantastic. Um, Dr. Loomis, why don't we start with you and just do a quick, uh, you know, a, a quick check on, uh, from your perspective, uh, uh, kind of what really kind of rose to the top as you worked on, on this report. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, well, my section report was about uh, helping athletes get a good deep breath. Um, and, and we know that asthma is very prevalent amongst athletes when I took care of the professional teams. Um, we had a lot of players with asthma. If you look at the, at the research, about 20% of the, both the, the U.S. Olympic team in 1996 and the British Olympic team at the 2002 Olympics um, uh, were, had the, carried the diagnosis of asthma. Um, and what we know is, is that dairy plays a fairly significant role in, in the, is a causative factor of asthma. Uh, for example, we know that cow's milk allergy is the most common allergy, food allergy in children. A, a significant number of those, of, of those children who have cow's milk allergy go on to develop uh, asthma. We also know that people with asthma are much more likely to have things like cow's milk allergy. And, and it's felt that the, the reason that milk is um, one of the causative factors for asthma is that we come to understand that asthma is really an inflammatory disease. Um, it's caused by chronic inflammation in the respiratory tract. And we know th uh, that, that foods that are high in saturated fat, for example, um, um, are one of the, the triggers for, for, for um, uh, developing asthma. And the number one source of saturated fat in the, in the, in the uh, Western diet is in fact dairy. It's milk, full fat milk and cheese. Um, so, so, you know, I was a, I, I was a uh, NAIA collegiate athlete and I had, I ran track and I had actually exercise induced asthma. And I remember, you know, hard workouts on the track at the end, I'd be coughing and wheezing and, you know, having to hit the inhaler uh, to, to do the next set. And um, when I transitioned to a plant-based diet and got rid of the dairy uh, a number of years ago, I found all of a sudden, you know, I got to throw all those inhalers away. And that's been my experience with many, many athletes um, who have transitioned to a plant-based diet. Amazing, so powerful. Uh, let's just continue here with just some initial perspectives. Uh, Dr. Sadecki, let's go, with, uh, go to you. Um, Kind of again, what rose to the top as you worked on this report, and, and what uh, can you offer just to kick us off uh, about the section you worked on? Yeah, I'm, I'm just so happy and privileged that I was a part of this report. You know, I suffered from a um, multitude of problems with uh, consumption of dairy in my lifetime, and as an ex athlete, a bodybuilder, I suffered with uh, severe eczema, high cholesterol, and all kinds of problems and severe fatigue. So I'm really happy to have been a part of it. So thank you so much for having me. Um, well, I, I would like to talk about the GI tract and focus on athletic performance when it comes to the GI tract and the digestive tract. Um, as a gastroenterologist, I encounter many, many athletes who come in with all kinds of inflammatory problems that uh, prohibits them from, from playing uh, football, basketball, and volleyball, and all kinds of sports. Um, it turns out that the digestive tract harbors a hundred trillion gut microbiome. From mouth to anus, um, these gut microbiome reside in the um, in the GI tract all over, mostly in the colon, and play a symbiotic relationship with us where they contribute into the, the, the digestive process, um, they ferment um, some of the nutrients that we consume, and produce um, either inflammatory molecules or uh, pro, um, uh, uh, basically, molecules that help uh, the skeletal muscle and even um, help us get stronger. Um, so what happened, what it, as it turns out that one of the worst things you can eat in your diet is a high amount of saturated fat. Why? Because when you consume a ton of foods with saturated fat, based on some uh, studies, it causes a breakdown of the tight junctions between the cells in the gut and causes what we call leaky gut, which um, it, it pr promotes inflammation. On the other hand, uh, when you consume a lot of fiber, uh, this fiber is consumed by the gut microbiome and through a process of fermentation produces what we call short chain fatty acids, which actually promote health and well-being and promote um, a healthy gut and skeletal muscle health. Um, health. So when it comes to athletic performance, what do we care about? Mostly six things when it comes to nutrition for athletes. We wanna maintain adequate nutri nutrition, 
We want to maintain a healthy weight. We want um, optimal protein, including branching amino acids. We want to control um, uh, markers of disease and inflammation. We want to have proper levels of carbohydrates for the high performance exercises that the athletes do. And we want sufficient um, uh, intake of um, energy. Well, it turns out that unfortunately, um, most athletic directors and coaches push a ton of protein and not enough fiber, which is enough, which is what's supposed to be healthy for the GI tract. Um, why is it important to think of along those lines? Well, because we want to be able to maintain those six levels of um, um, goals for uh, nutrition without having GI tract upset, like bloating and gas and flatulence, excessive burping, heartburn, diarrhea, constipation, and abdominal distension, because athletes need to be comfortable when they're performing at those levels. So if you put too much uh, focus on um, consuming a ton of protein and, a t and, and um, you know, choose the wrong fluid or food to accomplish that task, what happens is the athletes are getting a ton of saturated fat, which breaks down the, uh, the gut um, uh, walls and causes leaky gut, and a ton of toxic materials that I can, um, I'll discuss with you in a minute. So it, it, it's very important that you decide what to recommend to the athletes because where that protein came from is very, very important. What source did it come from? Well, it turns out that uh, dairy, so yes, I get it. Dairy milk has calcium and it has protein, but to consume dairy cow's milk for protein or calcium is like drinking soda for potassium. You just don't do that. It's very important to realize that athletes need about one to two grams per kilogram of lean body mass of protein. But what happens if someone decides, you know what, I'm just gonna go for three grams per kilogram or four grams per kilogram. Let me just consume a ton of this cow's milk protein. Well, what ends up happening is this extra protein actually ends up escapes digestion because your body won't be able to handle that big of a load of protein. It, would, uh, it could escape di digestion. This protein goes farther down into the colon and check this out. It actually, the gut microbiome that we talked about, ferments that protein into toxic, harmful products like ammonia, amines, phenols, sulfide, and endols. It's no wonder. All, this happens all the time where uh, kids go to college, start um, their careers, and they start in sports, and they come to me with inflammatory bowel disease. And this happens all the time. Um, if furthermore, um, people who have a lactose intolerance, which by the way, 70% of us do, um, and the ones like such as me, if you have lactose intolerance, it, it's not because you're abnormal. Uh, people who can actually break down lactose sugar have a mutation that can do so. So if you cannot break down cow's milk, that's quite okay. You're actually normal. But if you're sensitive to it and you continue pushing yourself as an athlete, you will have irritable bowel syndrome and SIBO. There are studies with patients with irritable bowel syndrome where people, um, where, where they studied these people who drank a bunch of cow's milk and they actually developed hydrogen gases and, and gases that would indicate that the, the milk is causing a dysbiosis, which in English means an imbalance of the gut microbiome. So anyway, just remember, um, one other thing I have to tell you is that um, a lot of the uh, d dietitians who don't understand um, the the entire picture, who promote dairy to their athletes, they don't they they they, they claim that dairy is not inflammatory. Well, let me tell you, it is because if you take patients with uh, lactose sensitivity and you study them, you actually find white blood cells and mast cells in their small bowel and colon. These are inflammatory cells ready to attack. And so how could you claim that it's not inflammatory? Anyway, anyhow, that's why as a gastroenterologist and um, someone who promotes health, I want athletic directors to put way out the risks and the benefits when they recommend dairy to their athletes. Super powerful, Dr. Sadecki. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Mara. Let's uh, I'll go with you next, and and you've got such a fascinating perspective on this topic. Uh, tell us more about how you engage with the report and some things that uh, our viewers really should take out. Yeah, so my section was more on the environment and more specifically environmental toxins, and and a way to relate this to athletes is really it's about small things, right? We're looking at shaving off a half a second 
on a 40 mile dash or if you're trying to lift a little bit heavier you're looking at small things when it comes to nutrition you want to add proteins and fats and healthy vitamins and minerals well so another section of this is looking at the environment and looking at the small things that are within our food these small things being environmental toxins and so the biggest source of environmental toxins when it comes to human exposure is coming from what we eat more specifically this is animal products because animal products contain 95% of the dioxin exposure. What are, what are dioxins? Dioxins are, are essentially industrial chemical byproducts. If you wonder where the housing for your TV or your entertainment center came from, your plastic remote, your plastic products, your plastic office chairs, that is coming from the chemical industry. That unfortunately ends up in our water supply, in our soil, and in our food. Now, why don't vegetables have more of these dioxins than animal products? Well, we, animals like us and even humans do something called bioaccumulation. So we bioaccumulate these toxins and it's stored specifically in, in fat cells. And again, what we've heard throughout from everyone speaking today, saturated fat. Again, if you're eating cheese, that is a big block of fat. If you're drinking whole milk, that is a ton of saturated fat. So we also have to look at these small things that, that has been overlooked, which are these environmental toxins and how they can disrupt not only athletic performance, but your performance for just baseline operations like your heart and your lungs and your gut microbiome and how detrimental that can be. So not only just to be, you know, barely functioning, but especially to be an optimal athlete, we have to look at these environmental toxins because they will make a profound difference. Really powerful stuff. Thank you so much for, for, for sharing that. Uh, here for our participants to jump in with questions. Again, you can use that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and uh, we will get to as many as we can. Um, and don't be shy. Uh, our, we are here for you and to provide uh, clarity and uh, uh, an understanding of both the report but also the, the amazing experience of, of our panel here. Um, I want to just maybe kind of kick off the Q and A with with one, not to uh, not to boil down what is a, obviously an incredibly complex subject, uh, but you know, Dotsie, I've heard you say this uh, numerous times. Really, at the end of the day, uh, the athletes have a pretty simple agenda: um, how do you get the most good with the least bad? And um, just want to kind of hear maybe you could start us off, Dotsie, and invite the panelists to to jump in. Um, as it relates to that very simple sounding equation, how do you get the most good with the least bad? Um, how does Dairy Free advance that agenda uh, more specifically? Could you break that down for us? Yeah, sure. You know, as, as elite athletes, um, we really want to fuel our bodies and try and give it the most bang for the buck, right? We got to take in a lot of calories. So we want pretty much every calorie that we bring in to bring in the most amount of good, like you said, and the least amount of bad. Um, and we want the most premium fuel that we can possibly get our hands on for our engines. And that is where the issue with, with dairy lies. Um, dairy has nutrients. I mean, obviously it does. It's, it's, um, it's milk for a growing uh, baby. Um, but, you know, a Twinkie has some nutrients. The problem is dairy also comes with a lethal dose of testosterone, um, estrogen. In fact, 70% of our dietary estrogen comes from dairy foods. Uh, it also has progesterone. It has cortisol, which is our stress hormone, which you know none of us, including athletes, need any more of. Saturated fats, as it's been mentioned a few times already. Trans fats and even certain molecules that our human body doesn't recognize, um, like D-galactose and NEU5GC, which are just simple sugar molecules, but uh, the human body does not make those. So when we ingest something that our body doesn't recognize, uh, what happens? Uh, our body mounts a defense system, and that is always in the form of inflammation. So chronic inflammation, uh, not to be confused with acute inflammation, that's when you sprain or maybe break your ankle and, and it swells, uh, and that is your body healing itself. But chronic inflammation and oxidative stress are big enemies of the athlete. Uh, and also, you know, cow's milk has two proteins in it. 
It has casein and whey, and cow's milk is made up of about 80% casein. Uh, and casein has been showed in, in, in studies to increase mucus production, as uh, Dr. Loomis really pointed out uh, at the beginning of this uh, webinar, uh, in the gut and in the respiratory tract. Uh, it exacerbates uh, and impairs breathing problems, uh, asthma. Uh, if you wake up with a chronic stuffy nose, kind of a dry cough, all of these things can really be exacerbated by drinking cow's milk. So that's why we want to really understand the full picture, right? Not just part of the picture of, oh, it has some protein in it. Uh, thousands and thousands of other foods uh, have protein in them and they don't have, they don't come with the bad, right? They don't come with the deleterious effects uh, to our body like cow's milk does. So uh, Chris, let me jump in and build on uh, some of the things Dotsky was talking about, because I, I think really this gets to, I think, one of the the root problems we have in, in the Western world, whether we're talking, when we talk about uh, nutrition for, for performance, but, but nutrition for health in general. And that's this idea that, that, you know, we don't talk about food anymore. Uh, we practice profound nutritional reductionism. And, and we worry about what food's made out of, right? We talk about proteins, we talk about fats, we talk about carbs, we talk about fiber, we talk about vitamins, um, but not in the context of food. And when we, um, when we deconstruct the food into its macro, macro and micronutrient um, um, uh, uh, components, it, it, really it, it really gives us some wacky ideas about food, right? So, you know, 30 years ago, we were, we were demonizing uh, fat and worshiping carbs, you know, the era of snack wells cookies. Now we're, we're worshiping protein, we're demonizing carbs. Um, but, but carbs aren't the problem. Protein aren't, isn't the problem. It's the package that our food comes in is the problem. And, and so you, you take dairy, uh, you know, you take dairy, you know, basically what, what dairy is, it's deconstructed grass, right? So the cow has eaten the plants, has used all the good stuff, the fiber that, that, that Dr. Sadecki was talking about how important that is for our health, the fiber, the phytonutrients, the antioxidants, you know, the vitamins, they've used all of that for their own benefit and just concentrated what's left into protein fat. And then because of the way we grow it, you know, as James pointed out in Dotsie, you know, we've added all these hormones and environmental toxins on top of that. So, so um, you know, I, I think when we, when we go straight to the source, when we eat plants as our source of protein, for example, if that's what you're looking for, and plants have protein, you know, the protein in milk came from the plants that the cow ate, right? So when we, when we eat the food, uh, go to the root source, not only do we get the protein that we need, we also get all the phytonutrients, antioxidants, it's gonna help you recover faster, you know, on and on and on. And so, so you know, I, 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 a simple example of what I'm talking about is an apple, right? So a small apple has about 25 grams of carbs, about 100 calories, mostly fructose. No, I don't think anyone would argue that somehow an apple is some unhealthy food, right? But, but where is that sugar? Well, it's in the apple. We eat the apple. We, we actually do burn calories to digest the apple. The soluble fiber in the, in the, in the apple um, um, so slows the progression to our digestive tract, serves a prebiotic for healthy gut bacteria downstream. We slowly excite the sugar. Our, our, you know, our um, um, uh, sugar levels don't rise very quickly. It doesn't trigger a big insulin response. Um, we take that same apple, and we squeeze out the exact same 25 grams of carbs, the exact same 100 calories. You put it in a glass, we run it over to the lab and analyze the same carbs, it's the same, same um, 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 uh, calories, and we drink it. In no way, shape, or form are those calories and those carbs the same, right? So, so, so carbs, were, and so what happens? You drink a big glass of, 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 of juice before you go work out, your insulin levels, your sugar levels spike, your insulin levels spike, and then an hour later, 30 minutes later, you're, you're hypoglycemic, right? And so, so, so carbs weren't the problem there. It's the package the carbs come in, right? And you can, and that's true for many other, you know, it's when we talk about protein, we talk about fat. We, so, so that's another way to kind of frame this idea around, around dairy is not being a health food. Because when you're trying to recover from exercise, you know, consuming a food that has that same amount of protein and, and, and you know, energy, plus all of the, uh, um, the anti-inflammatory antioxidant compounds are going to help you recover faster and, 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 you know, to get you over to your next workout or competition. That's why that's so important. Great stuff. I, 
it, 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 you've already raised a couple of times uh, kind of the kryptonite for athletes and inflammation and, and the negative effects it, it causes. Um, maybe kind of two parts uh, to this is first, how quickly can an athlete see a benefit from going dairy free? And maybe slightly a nuanced version of that same question. Um, you know, how much dairy is too much? Meaning if somebody is practicing moderation, maybe doesn't want to go full dairy free, is there some sort of, you know, uh, leveling uh, that uh, he or she should be seeking in their dairy consumption? Well, I can, you know, I, I think, um, as Dr. Sadecki pointed out earlier, about 70% of the world population is lactose intolerant. And that can be, that can be from varying degrees. You know, you, you, you look at lactose and you get diarrhea. But many people have lactose intolerance and don't even know it because the symptoms are very subtle, right? You know, you get a little bloating, a little get gas. That stuff will go away immediately, right? The minute you stop using dairy, if, you're, if you have any, any amount of lactose intolerance, um, um, that will go away very quickly. If, if you've got dairy triggering your asthma, that will go away very quickly, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so the, you know, if, if you're working on other chronic health issues like cholesterol and, and things like that, it, it, or, or reversing, say, insulin resistance, that may take a little bit longer. Um, but but from, from an athlete standpoint, you know, I found that people really will experience um, the benefits very short term. Fantastic. Um, James, Mer over to you for, for, for uh, a question. Um, you, this, your, your perspective and, and expertise in the in environmental uh, toxins, um, likely relatively uh, a new uh, dilemma or aspect here to look at. Can you break down a little bit more just what is uh, driving this uh, kind of new understanding of the impact on the environmental mm -hmm. toxins as it relates to our diet. And in particular, um, what should athletes be on the lookout for uh, in regard to environmental toxins so that they can continue their education with uh, its, its impact on their performance? Yeah, I think, I think very simply put, it, it's going back to these small things. It's going back to the risk and the benefits, right? So like, like we said throughout, you know, you want to minimize the risks and amplify the benefits. So how do you do that? Overall, a very general rule is decreasing animal product intake. And that would, a simple way to do that would start with dairy because one, there's so many alternatives. There's wonderful plant milks out there. There's wonderful plant cheeses out there. If you still want to have those textures and flavors, that's great. You're still going to get all the nutrition required from dark leafy greens and beans and nuts and seeds, which is excellent. So you're not missing the nutritional aspect. So it, it's a no brainer. Um, you know, when it comes to what's driving all this, I mean, it's, it's a simple fact that we've never been where we are in history, right? If you go back even 50 years, many things were in glass. We didn't have as much plastic. We didn't have as much industry when it came to all the Roku's and the Playstations and the Nintendo and all, you know, we're, we're, just, we're essentially just manufacturing more plastic items, more throwaway items and more industry in general. So it's an interesting point where we're going, wow, we've introduced 80,000 plus synthetic chemicals into the environment. What is that gonna do? Has there ever been a study to test all 80,000 chemicals and what they do synergistically in the human body? The answer is no. Now, why did we even start testing dairy milk and animal products for this? It's because we found these chemicals in the human body. We found these chemicals in umbilical cord blood. We found these chemicals in amniotic fluid. We found these chemicals in human breast milk. So it's prompted more and more people to ask the question, if it's in us, is it in what we eat? And the answer is yes. And really we're getting to a point where we've exported trash to China and China and India are now having to deal with our trash and our recyclables and go, what do we do with all this plastic? What do we do with all these synthetic you know, textiles? And the answer is they don't know either. So now we're researching more and more and more and we're not liking what we find. So really it goes back to the individual as saying, hey, how do we stop this? How do we collectively come together and make this win-win-win scenario by saying, hey, we're not gonna buy into these products that destroy the environment. More importantly, we're not gonna vote with our dollar on foods that destroy the environment. And then as an added bonus, these foods also destroy our health 
and when we're talking about optimal health and fitness as an athlete, they degrade that as well. So we can have this win, win, win across the board and say enough's enough. Let's stop this chemical pollution in our bodies and in our environment all in one swoop. And all of us have the power to do that. And that is important for everybody to understand. Very powerful stuff. Um, you know, the report really, uh, one aspect of the report that I think is particularly provocative is um, the level of, of marketing and propaganda uh, that has gone into marketing of dairy products. And, and Dr. Sadeki, I just want to ask for, for you, I know you're not a marketing specialist, uh, so I'm not going to ask you any tough marketing questions, but I'm just curious, as you see patients, um, do you often see these kind of marketing myths or, or marketing truths come into your practice? And could you maybe kind of just share a perspective on that? Uh, maybe what are, what are some of the most common misperceived claims that come into your office? Uh, perhaps, uh, you know, chocolate milk being a recovery drink or something like that. Could you maybe just um, talk a little bit about that? Yeah, honestly, I'm just going to be open and honest with you. I think it's criminal to sell dairy cow's milk as health food. It's not health food. And I'll break it down for you. Um, so milk sugar is lactose. This is the main sugar in milk. And in, in, in one cup or 250 ml of uh, milk, there is 12.5 grams of sugar, lactose sugar. Now, in the GI tract, there's an enzyme called lactase that is supposed to break down this sugar. Um, it turns out that um, we lose the ability um, we, our, our brush, it's a brush border enzyme inside our gut and um, we lose the lactase sugar as we grow older and we don't require mother's breast milk. So as we get older, we lose the ability to break down this sugar. Now, this, this um, baby calf growth fluid, otherwise known as milk, is sold to the general population as health food, as you said. Okay, let me break it down to you, for you. It's reported based on the NIH estimates, Asians 95% lactose intolerant, um, Ashkenazi Jews and African Americans, 60 to 80% of them are lactose intolerant. Uh, Native Americans, 80 to 100% of them are lactose intolerant. Hispanics, 50 to 80% of them are lactose intolerant. Worldwide, it's estimated that 68 to 70% of us are lactose intolerant. So how could you ignore this data and sell this baby calf growth fluid as a health food? It should be illegal to do so. Now, let me just give you an example because we're talking to athletes and athletic directors. Imagine there's th there are 13,000 Olympians uh, competing in the summer and winter Olympics. 8,840 of them will be in the bathroom having diarrhea, constipation, change in the bowel habits, bloating, belching, burping, abdominal distension, and discomfort to a varying degree, and fatigue. Why would you promote something to athletes when it causes fatigue? Let me um, break this down. They did a recent review of 2,000 patients um, and, and they realized that they had neurological symptoms, including fatigue and headaches, when they were lactose intolerant and they were consuming dairy. Now, to tell me that all, like any athletic director listening, to, 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 to think that 100% of their athletes are, are fine and they're not lactose intolerant, they're wrong, because statistics and studies go against that. They're, it's clear that this lactose sugar is not digested in the small bowel and it escapes digestion and goes inside the colon, gets fermented by the gut microbiome that we spoke about into toxic molecules that cause fatigue and all kinds of problems like bloating and gas. And my, um, as a physician, my suggestion would be what you promote your athletes should be um, a fluid that promotes uh, muscle, pro muscle gains and uh, athletic performance without the deleterious effects that dairy causes. And you have many choices. And we don't really need to um, choose dairy as, um, as a fluid of choice. That's great. If I can but, add, yeah, please go ahead. If I can add to the myths too, I just had to touch on from a dietetics and still keeping the environmental side in play, uh, whey and casein protein and just the rise in whey and casein protein powders. I mean, since the late 80s till now, I mean, just the, 
the abnormal use of these powders, whether you are an athlete in the Olympics or on a sports team, to uh, a, a single stay-at-home mother who's taking copious amounts of these whey and casein proteins. I mean, just the negative effects we see in our office and our practice when someone is consuming these on a daily basis, on top of the fact that many studies are coming out to show that these protein powders are contaminated. Not only are they contaminated from the source, they're contaminated with heavy metals, they're contaminated with pesticide residues. We have to think not only were they contaminated from the source, going back to what the heck that cow ate, to what was in the factory, to then it being bottled and manufactured as a powder and who knows how long it's been staying on the shelf, and so we have to factor all these things in when we start to, you know, characterize that myth of, ooh, this, this powder in this bucket is going to make me healthy. It's like you have to understand the process to really see how kind of crazy that is to think this powder in this plastic bucket is going to then make me healthy. There are many, many other sources of protein that will actually make you healthy. Dr. I'm going to come your way all this talk about uh, Olympians and Olympic athletes. It occurs to me that uh, you're the only Olympian here. So, uh, dairy bad. Uh, certainly, uh, I think uh, both Dr. Sadecki and uh, Mr. Marin just, you know, uh, really crystallized for us. Let's talk alternatives because there's, um, you know, uh, first of all, folks may say, well, you know, I can't really go to soy either because that's bad too. So what am I really left with here? How am I really going to get to the performance that I really need? So, Maybe reflect on your own personal experience a little bit and kind of break down some of the alternatives, particularly for somebody looking to make that first step towards dairy free. Right, for sure. Well, I think it would be uh, it would help us all if if we do go into soy a little bit and it's it's protective nature. And I think uh, you know any of any of these three would would be fantastic at that because I think it's a very important topic. Because I did lean into uh, soy milk and even chocolate soy milk if I wanted to spoil myself sometimes. Uh, as a, as an athlete, you know sometimes you're training at such a level and so hard that it is true. It's it's a bit difficult to uh, chew and swallow and get the, get the food down. Uh, and, and you want something that is a, a liquid form and that's kind of, I think, you know, what milk likes to tout is it's so easy, you know, it's so accessible. It's so easy. So I would just switch over to uh, a soy milk, but, but, you know, nowadays I'd probably do a combination of hemp milk and coconut milk because I want the, the recovery from the, uh, the protein and, uh, and the fat and the carbohydrate. And, uh, but I also want the micronutrients that are, that are in those milk milks. But if I, if I'm not in a space where I just need something liquid, I mean, the best Best recovery to me is a peanut butter jelly sandwich. That's it. It's real simple. It doesn't get any easier than that. And it has absolutely everything you need to start repairing uh, your muscles. About, uh, you know, 45 to a minutes to an hour after intense exercise, you do want to start moving into uh, taking in some proteins. But immediately after exercise, you want to take in glycogen. So, uh, you know, that lends itself to just... Um, glycogen <laughs> taking in you know a sports drink or something to start that repair and that recovery process and then moving into something that uh, has all the macronutrients and micronutrients so um, I would often uh, be found eating just a big bowl of uh, rice or quinoa with greens and beans and and hemp seeds on top because that was everything and it it was simple enough that it was easy on my gut and the taste was you know simple enough too that it that it, you know, I, it went down well and it didn't give me any kind of indigestion. So um, those are some possibilities. And I, I can build Please a little bit of the soy question. Um, and, and just as an aside, as far as recovery, I, in my, as I, I, I still participate and I've kind of re, I, I have become athletic again later in life and, um, and uh, have done Ironman triathlon and such. And I can tell you, I did a lot of research about, about the best way to prevent delayed onset muscle soreness and stiffness. And it was actually just a recent review um, last, a pretty a comprehensive review last year. And um, to the, the, the two food, the two things that have, have clearly been shown, have the best evidence around preventing delayed onset muscle soreness and stiffness are, is tart cherry juice actually, and then omega-3 fatty acids. And so to Dati's point about really getting that glycogen rebuilt up, which has come from our carbohydrate, I, did, I drank a, a recovery drink that had tart cherry juice, frozen bananas, blueberries, kale, chia seed. I put some cinnamon and turmeric and ginger, all very highly anti-inflammatory spices, and um, was really astonished at how well I felt even after these monster bike ride and brick 
work at runs and, and monster runs and swims and, and things like that. And, you know, and I was, you know, in my late sixties, late fifties, sixty-ish uh, at the time and never got sore, never got stiff, et cetera. Um, but back to the soy, you know, that is another kind of myth uh, that, that somehow soy is going to, and, and it's fairly prevalent actually in the, the athletic community that soy is bad. And, you know, men, if you drink soy milk, you're going to get man boobs and, you know, it increases your risk for, for um, um, uh, breast cancer and things like that. And, and that has to do with the presence of phytoestrogens, which are phyto just means plants and then estrogens. So the plant-based estrogens, which naturally occur in soy. But it turns out that, in fact, uh, as Dotsie alluded to, that these phytoestrogens are actually protective against many of these chronic um, 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 uh, diseases, particularly breast cancer. I mean, if you look at, at population data, you know, the countries with the lowest rates of breast cancer in the world is Japan and then parts of China where, where, where soy consumption is high. And the reason is, is these phytoestrogens are weak binders to the estrogen receptors. And, and, um, and so they actually block the effect of estrogen, the full effect. And, and I think it's pretty clear that one of the major risk factors for breast cancer, for example, is in fact a lifelong overexposure to estrogen, right? And so, you, you know, women who start their periods at a very young age, um, women have never had children, so you don't take a break from estrogen. Um, obesity is a, is, a, is a risk factor because actually our fat cells can convert other hormones into estrogen. One of the major sources of estrogen, however, in the human diet, I think as Dotsy and, and maybe James pointed out earlier, is in fact dairy products because you have to keep the cows lactating to, to make the milk. And so, so um, um, you know, there's lots of research to show that, that soy consumption, uh, and I'm not talking about processed soy, highly processed soy like textured vegetable protein, I'm talking about relatively whole food sources. So tofu is a little bit processed, it's just, it's just curdled soy milk and they scrape the curd. So it's, it's a little processed, but not highly processed. You know, edamame, uh, uh, tempeh, things like that, um, have actually been shown to reduce, again, as I said earlier, reduce the risk. And the women who have had breast cancer actually prolongs survival. Um, so there's absolutely nothing wrong with incorporating soy into your diet from a, from a health standpoint. Hmm. So one of the questions we all, uh, often get is, you know, uh, why isn't why is it taking us this, this long to uncover these truths? Uh, and I know that's a deeply philosophical question. There is no perfect answer there, but I just want to kind of open that up for the full panel. Uh, all of the science that is uncovered through this report and through all of your your collective work, uh, very powerful, clear that this message isn't breaking through. Two questions, I guess. But actually, maybe I would just keep it at this. What can we all do collectively to get this science out more? to the people who need it the most. Dr. Sadecki, why don't we start with you? Well, I think uh, the truth is going to prevail. And as doctors and as dietitians, we're going to have to come out and speak up because we've seen um, year for years, the dairy industry, they have the big pockets and they have a ton of resources and money to spend at advertising, which is false advertising, and they've gotten away with it. But now finally, athletes and doctors and dietitians are coming out and pointing out um, to what's happening. Um, it's going to come out, but the unfortunate fact is that until this, the truth is out, many people will suffer. And uh, some sustain irreversible damage to their body and to their health, and it's unfortunate, but it's time for us to speak up. And um, thanks to Dotsy and, and your organization, Switch for Good, it's happening. It's just that we just need to galvanize all the spirits and go at it harder because we're competing with a multi-billion dollar industry. It's, it's, it's not easy, but, um, you know, it's doable. We just, we just, we have to persist. We have to, um, we have to keep going with the truth because if you study this report and I encourage everyone to read it and there are hundreds of resources on there, references, this is a scientific report and we have delineated the, um, uh, the factors that we've spoken about and, and today we only pointed out a few and I challenge you to read it and please look at our references. Everything we're talking about is evidence-based. Everything we, we're talking about is the truth and the answer is there. You just have to look at it. And I understand it's hard because of all the billions of dollars the dairy industry is um, 
putting into commercials, but it's all advertising. It's not science. Let's just build on that real quick, just through the lens of chocolate milk in particular, because as the report really uncovers, uh, particularly aggressively here over the last couple of years, we've seen a real inundation of chocolate milk as a recovery drink, really being marketed by athletes and, and, and sponsoring athletes all the way down to the high school level. Um, you've, Dr. Loomis, from your point of view, you know, within the athletes you've worked with, with the professional teams, um, what advice can you give to players as they are looking at some of this mar marketing propaganda being kind of, you know, of course, those athletes are inundated with those claims. Any tools or tricks that you can offer to the athletes on how to sift through and maybe, you know, talk a little bit about what we found in the chocolate milk uh, research, if you want. Mike. Yeah, so, you know, as it, it, it has been pointed out, I mean, the problem is we're, we're against this kind of juggernaut of, of, of industry, industry in, in, within the industry, funded partially by our taxpayer dollars. I mean, you know, you look at the dairy checkoff programs, which run, which le have led to the, the Got Milk and the Real Cheese programs. I mean, those are those are those are taxpayer funded marketing initiatives that the USDA um, uh, runs. Um, also, with beef and real beef and you know white meat, new white. Those are all part of the checkoff program. So you're right; it is a daunting task to overcome. I think the, the other issue we, we have, and I certainly saw a lot of this. Now, now, granted, I was the team doctors before I transitioned to a plant-based diet, um, but I did learn a lot about a what I thought was sports nutrition at the time, but also how these very high functioning athletes thought about nutrition. And I can tell you that there is a lot of what I call bro science going on here, right? And, and that starts, at, that starts in, high, in the high school weight room, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you see a guy that's big and strong and you want to be like that guy and he's, he's pounding chocolate milk or whey protein shakes after and, you know, because that's what he tells you is healthy. So that's what you do. And, and without really stopping to think about is that, you know, what is there truth behind that? Is there evidence to support it? And yeah, I can get big and strong, but what else is that doing to my body detrimentally, you know, down the road? And so, um, so you know, the major source of nutrition information in, in the professional locker room was not the physician. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't a, a, a trained re registered dietitian, right? It was the strength and conditioning coach or even sometimes the athletic trainer or probably, or more importantly, you know, your teammate. And so, 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 so that is a very difficult kind of nut to crack, frankly, because um, um, you really do need to educate yourself because, you know, there, you've had a lot of stuff thrown at you. And, and to, to paraphrase an American politician once said, we can all have our own opinions, but we can't have our own facts. And it's been pointed out, uh, I, I think, very elegantly in, in this paper, um, the facts are that dairy is not a health food and it's not a, it doesn't enhance performance and it, you know, it, it doesn't enhance recovery, uh, that there are a lot of other healthier ways to go about fueling yourself before, during, and after exercise. And, and, you know, so, so it, it takes, I think, educating the, 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 you know, the strength and conditioning coaches, educating the dietitians associated with the team, educating the team doctors, educating the, the, the players themselves so that they can take, you know, control, take responsibility for the food that goes in their mouth. And, and I can tell you, you know, the, these are, I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of money to be made in professional sports. And, and so these guys are in tune with their bodies, but, but, but what, the way they're fueling themselves, yeah, they may perform at a high level, but especially as they, as they start to get a little bit older, being able to maintain that performance over time, uh, being able to prevent the chronic diseases that are associated with not eating a healthful diet. So you get to enjoy the fruits of your labor after you retire too. I mean, that's something else we don't think about. Um, and, you know, all very, very important. Um, and so, so yes, it's tough. A, it's, it is hard. Uh, there is a lot of kind of misinformation out there, but the, 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 the wonderful thing is now, it, it, you know, you watch the movie, The Game Changers, which, which Dotsie and I are, are, are both had the privilege to be involved with. You know, you read this report, the truth is out there, right? And so I think it's, it's, it's really taking control of, of, of your own health and your own performance and educating yourself about what the truth really is. Mm -hmm. 
I think, Chris, I, I'd, I'd love to build on that as it uh, relates to um, us mere mortals who are not physicians, because I think physicians by nature are critical thinkers. Um, these uh, two are certainly, and uh, Ed James as well. But uh, I think we really need to, to make sure that as consumers, and then uh, as athletes, that we start to think more critically about the marketing that's being put in front of us. I know that I felt very frustrated um, under uh, the flag of the uh, U.S. Olympic Committee when the d dietitians and nutritionists, you know, really couldn't figure out what was going to be an equivalent to cow's milk. Uh, and they started quoting different studies that the dairy industry has do had done. And so I said, it's time for me to, to take a deep dive and take a look and think about these uh, more critically. And uh, the, the um, you know, flagship study on builtwithchocolatemilk.com, you can go right there. It's the first one. They have 20 of them, and it's the first one they talk about. Um, and they, they tout uh, milk that, as a uh, perfect, I think they say, uh, recovery be beverage. And when you just look at the study, I mean, you don't even really have to go much further than the abstract. You find out that uh, they studied um, uh, some people in a couple of different sports. And in order to prove that chocolate milk was a premium recovery beverage, uh, the controls they used were A, water, and B, a sports beverage. So they did not use uh, beverages that were nutrient equivalent to chocolate milk. Uh, neither one of those have any protein in them. So yep, something with protein is going to be a better recovery. And if you go just a little bit further, you find out that to make this claim, who they studied were seven Irish men. Seven. So that's probably not uh, going to produce a statistically significant study. Uh, and it's also going to tell you uh, that they handpicked Irish men that are not lactose intolerant. You can see that uh, in the small print. Uh, and so they are saying that this is a fantastic recovery drink for everyone. Uh, it might help some Irishmen recover uh, as they don't have lactose intolerant. It's, they're still gonna get a hell of a lot of hor hormones and a lot of saturated fat and trans fats, but that cannot then be said that it is a fantastic recovery for all of us. I, I have to just add, when you, when you do this deep dive, you see the systemic adulteration happening across the board. And I like to say, you know, for everyone watching this, it is a grassroots to grass tips movement. And so an example of the grassroots is Dotsie and Switch for Good. And I mean, just that amazing analysis. And when you look deeper and you're exposing these truths, uh, you know, giving some more hope, looking at the grass tips, you have the Canadian government who said, look, dairy is no longer in our, our nutrient profile, we're no longer recommending this to Canadians. And they did that because they excused and basically uh, took out studies that were funded by the dairy industry. And when the Canadian government did that, they found, wow, there's really no science saying drink dairy, especially like the US is saying at least three servings every single day, and which is ridiculous. And so you have these movements, you have these two huge examples of hope going on, and we all need to continue you know, building upon this. So that's so, so important. Well, quite sadly, we are rapidly out of time here for this session. Uh, before anybody signs off, please uh, just know that uh, as the Zoom closes, you will see a screen that it gives you direct access uh, right to the report uh, at Switch for Good, along with a bunch of other resources to continue the discussion. Um, Dr. Loomis, Dr. Sadecki, uh, James, thank you so much for your time. Dotsie, to you for just one final closing uh, remark, if you would like uh, to, to encourage our audience to, to go further. Yeah, A, uh, kind of, you know, look behind the curtain. Think, think more critically so that you are in charge of your nutrition. You are in charge of your recovery and, and you can gather the facts. Uh, and then secondly, we're here to help. If you're, if you're ready to make a, a journey, a, a transition, just, you know, one glass at a time, we're here for you. So uh, feel free to email us, uh, uh, definitely read the report. We have a, um, a lot of uh, supportive elements on, on Switch for Good as to all the wonderful uh, docs and dietitians um, in the report and, and on here today. So visit us um, at switchforgood.org and you can download your, uh, download your athlete's power plate. I think that'll be really helpful to everyone listening. Excellent. Thanks everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Stay safe, stay sane, goodbye.